Do any of you remember when we used to get mail through the post? None of this electronic mail garbage. I'm talking about the old days, when you used to sit down and write a letter to someone and post it off. And then, maybe, a week or two later you get a reply. Seems like such a long time ago now, doesn't it? Well, it certainly is a long time in this story. And what could the explanation be for this strange mail that this man receives? Hmm. Now, I say this every time, don't I? I should invite you around the campfire more often than I do. Well, consider tonight's story me making up for not bringing you all together around the fire anywhere near often enough. So, huddle in a bit closer, everyone. I've got a little story to tell you. And it goes something like this. I'd just moved into a new apartment. It was basically a little house divided into two areas, an upstairs and a downstairs. I got the upstairs. It was very nice. My first bachelor pad. I had plans for parties with friends and family. Ideas for what each room was going to be. A place for my knickknacks. All of that, <laughs> I just got a new place nonsense. <sighs> I was loving it. A lot of people crumble when the real world knocks on their door, but I was basking in it. All of the stuff that drives people mad. Bills, finding problems with the apartment, calling cable companies, change of address forms. All of it, I just couldn't get enough. This was because it meant I was on my own. In my own space. My own man. Nobody to watch over me or tell me what to do. A few weeks in, all my mailing had been sorted out. I'd changed my address with everyone who might want to send me something. So, I was excited to get the mail. My mail! Every so often some junk mail would filter into my box. It didn't have my name on it. It was for the people who lived here before me. Some of it didn't have anyone's name on it. To the current resident. Yeah, if you don't care enough to put a name on it, I don't care enough to open it. One day, though, one of these junk letters caught my attention. It had the finger on it. You know, the red stamp of the hand with the finger pointing back to the return address with Return to Sender written on it in big letters. Normally, when you see that stamp, it means the sender got the address wrong. The recipient rejected the letter. Or the recipient had moved or died. Basically, it's never good news to see it. The strange part about it, though, was that the return address wasn't mine. I wasn't even familiar with the town name. Oh, I love letters. They're fascinating to me. Personal thoughts from one person to another. I've spent many hours online reading old letters that have been made available. It's so intrusively intimate to read the words created by one person, meant to be read by only one other, as if eavesdropping on someone's soul. So, this return letter was very intriguing. However, the person it was meant for, or the person who wrote it, could still be around. The return address, though, didn't have a name. It was just the address. I didn't think anything of it. I do the same thing sometimes. What was weird, though, was that the to address also had no name on it. That's not normal. I wanted to open it so badly, but I just couldn't. So I brought it inside with me and set it on the table, which came with the apartment. My willpower didn't hold out long. The next day I ripped into the letter. It ended up being a bit more exciting than I thought it would be. It read as follows. Dear F, it has been a while since we have seen each other, but I cannot remove you from my thoughts. You've been with me for all of my days these months past. Those nights when you taught me what it was to live, to love, and to feel, just seemed too impossible to have been real. You taught me what it was to touch and to be touched in ways and places I'd been led to believe to be obscene and even blasphemous. 
There is no way such a wonderful, pure feeling could be sinful. There is also, however, no way such a euphoric, sensual feeling could not be sinful. I wait and waste here, longing for your return. I know that won't happen until my husband once again leaves on whatever business trips he goes on. I'd feel ashamed if I wasn't so sure that he was doing the very same thing you and I did. Like you told me, he deserves it for neglecting me as he does so often. I often stare at the table on which we shared such pure joy. Henry will ask what I'm doing, and I only say, It's just a lovely piece of furniture which he laughs at and dismisses. I've kept your attention long enough. I will let you know when you can visit me again. Longingly, lovingly, S. It seemed I'd stumbled upon a love affair. I wasn't expecting anything so steamy. And it was signed S. I felt like I was living through a John Updike novel. Something about the letter was strange, though. It reminded me of many letters I've read before from previous centuries. The language seemed anachronistic. Nothing was wrong with it per se, but that's part of what was wrong with it. It was nearly perfect. People just didn't really talk like that anymore. How frequently does one hear the word oft? The letter was off. The address was off. Nothing felt quite right about this. I checked for a date on the envelope, but there was none. Maybe it was an old letter someone found, and they just shoved it into a random mailbox. But, if the contents outlined in an affair, that would explain why there were no names on it. I put the letter back on the table and went about my day. The next day, there was another letter with return to sender stamped on it. It was the same situation, no postmark and no names. I didn't open this one. I'd already pried enough, and if this was meant for someone, it could really exacerbate things if they didn't get it. I understood that what they were doing was wrong, but that's none of my business. I put both letters in a drawer, but had no clue as to what to do. <laughs> The phrase, out of sight, out of mind, is really true. I'd forgotten about the letter by the next day, and went days with even thinking about it. Eventually, I needed something out of my desk, I don't even remember what now, and I found the letters. Because some time had gone by, my moral dilemma regarding what to do about the letter had disappeared. So, I tore it open and read it immediately. F. It has been weeks since my last letter. Why are you not writing back? Maybe you did not feel the same as I did. Those days were magical, though. I'm not sure how one could experience bliss, such as did we, and feel nothing afterwards. The only other thing I can think of is that something horrid has happened. Either disaster has befallen you, or my husband is intercepting your replies. Either one could result in terrible consequences for you, for both of us. Please be careful. S. Yikes. This was already interesting, and it just got a lot more so. I put the letter away and went to bed. I woke up at around nine the next morning. I wouldn't bother mentioning the time, but it's important in this instance. The mail doesn't usually come through until almost twelve, but I saw that the hatch was open on the mailbox from the window, so I checked, and there was another letter. Return to sender stamped on it, just like the other two. Why was this sent so immediately after I'd read the last one? The second one came the day after I read the first one as well. Now, being as paranoid as I am, I looked around <laughs> like an idiot to see if anyone was around. Of course, they weren't. This could have been dropped off hours ago. This, however, made me think that, maybe, it was just a prank. Someone got a hold of one of those stamps and wanted to have some fun with the local new guy. 
I was still a bit creeped out, though, because they seemed to know when I read the letters. This would require nearly 24-hour surveillance. I took the letter inside, covered every window in my home and every crack in my walls to make sure nobody had any chance of seeing me, and put the letter away. I would test this. I would wait a random number of days before opening it, and see when the next one came. I waited for over a week. In that time, I received no new letters. I finally opened the letter at 2 a.m. I fear for my safety now. I believe my husband has found out about us. I believe him to be holding your letters, keeping them from me, keeping you from me. Even now, I write this in the only room of the house you will let me in. I have letters to you that I can't even get to you because of this. Twice weekly, he comes in and does things to me. Nothing I would not love if it were you doing it to me. But with him, it is so businesslike. <laughs> Just like him. Worrying only about the facts. There are no facts in love, and he cannot handle this. I should not have done this to him, but that gives him no right to do this to me. I would ask for your help, if I was not certain it would end in your death. This was by far the most unsettling of the letters. This guy was raping his own wife, and holding her captive in her own house. I know women used to essentially be property, but that was still very alarming to read. I realized then that I'd finished reading the letter. My paranoia once again got the better of me. So I went outside with a flashlight. The mailbox hatch was open again. No. That's impossible. I walked over to it and checked, shining the flashlight into it reluctantly, afraid of what I might see. Nothing. The wind had probably blown it open, or perhaps I'd forgotten to close it. I don't know. I felt incredibly foolish for even considering that the letter would be there. I laughed at myself and went back into the house. I wasn't even halfway up the stairs when there came a faint knock at the door. I turned quickly and shone my flashlight out of the window of the door, only to see nobody there. I opened the door and something fell from the jam. A letter. This was even more impossible than the mailbox being opened. This was a letter left at my door door. By whom? What mailman goes around at 2.30 in the morning? What mailman leaves letters in the door jam when the mailbox is right there? No, it couldn't be the mailman. It had to be someone else. I ran outside and screamed. I don't know who you are or why you're doing this, but the joke is over. It isn't funny, it isn't clever, and you're wasting your time. A few lights went on in some of the neighboring houses in response to the screaming. I didn't mean what I said. It was clever, and I'd find it funny if I were the one doing it. But the truth is, I was scared. Someone was watching me. This wasn't a postal service error. This was a deliberate attempt to give me these letters. To what end? I couldn't know. I didn't know what to do. I also didn't want to open this letter. All it would mean is that I'd get another one. Shaking, I went to bed. I didn't sleep, but I wasn't awake. I just laid there in some sort of limbo between consciousness and dreaming, passing the time, unable to think clearly about anything, and unable to think about anything other than those letters. Finally, somehow, I was able to drift off into some semblance of sleep. I woke up and called in sick to work. I had enough to deal with right now. I grabbed one of those envelopes and went to Google Maps. I typed in the intended address. We could not find the address. <laughs> that made sense, though. They were returned to sender. The address not existing is logical. This poor woman is getting herself into so much trouble over an incorrect address. I sat, disappointed, 
wondering why the address didn't exist anywhere. It must have been destroyed before our current address systems were put into place. I saw the unopened envelope sitting on my table, staring at me, inviting me. I opened the letter, but I saw no writing. Instead, it was a map. Something about the ink was amiss. It didn't look like normal ink, and the paper was tattered far beyond what the other letters were. This page appeared far older than any of the other letters. I had no idea what the map was showing me. There were a few little landmarks, like trees and houses, amateurishly doodled onto this paper. Dashed lines seemed to outline a path. There was also a solid line on the map, which looked to be another path, or maybe a road. The solid line went from one edge of the paper to the other, curving just slightly at the end. Just before the curve was a box. I thought maybe it represented a house. There were several small trees drawn between this box and another box. This box was marked with a circle. I had no idea what that meant. The dotted lines connected both of the boxes, and then also another object. It looked like a poorly drawn circle. But because the other circle on the page was well drawn, I guessed it was drawn that way on purpose. Maybe it was supposed to be a rock or something. The dotted line, at one point, branched in three directions, one branch going to each of the larger objects on the map. Where the dotted lines met was drawn a single tree. I'd provide a picture of it, but I don't have it anymore. There were a few other things drawn on this map, but nothing I could make enough sense of to write it down now. I put this back in the envelope and went back to trying to figure out where these letters were coming from. I typed in the return address. It was an empty field, full of grass and a line of trees. There was an odd formation on the ground, though. It looked like the foundation of a house to me, maybe even the remnants of a wall or something around the property. I couldn't tell. However, it was not far from me at all, so I immediately jumped in my car with the letters and headed to this plot of land. I drove just long enough to where I didn't have time to talk myself out of going through with it when I got on the road. I was driving around looking for this area, but I couldn't see anything resembling the empty lot. I then found myself at the end of the road. I was obviously very confused. I turned around, trying to look again, and, after about a minute of driving, I realized why I'd missed it. It wasn't empty. There was a house there. Right where that empty field was on the satellite image, there was a house. It even had the little room off to the side, stopping it from being just a big square. I had no idea how this was possible. I felt myself go pale as the blood rushed from my face. My entire body turned cold. I sat in my car, staring, and having no idea what exactly I was experiencing. When I finally regained control of myself, I got out of my car and headed toward the house. I had come this far, after all. I half laughed to myself when I saw that there was still a mailbox in front of the house. Out of morbid curiosity, I checked it. <laughs> Nothing was there. I walked up onto the porch. This place had obviously seen better days. Almost every window was broken, and those that weren't were covered in such a thick layer of dust that they were no longer transparent. The door seemed to be hanging off of one hinge. There were holes in the floorboards and various animal droppings all along the porch. There was an old swing hanging from only one chain, and a mostly decomposed cushion sagging off of it. The musty smell was awful. Now, I've been in damp basements before, and old buildings, but nothing compared to this. It was almost oppressive. I took a step inside. My assumptions about the door being proven correct, and, like every horror movie I've ever seen, I said hello. I always yell at those people to shut up. If someone's in there, you probably don't want to find them. But here I was, in the same position, doing the exact same thing. There was no answer. No clunking in the background or anything. 
so I felt relatively safe. I picked up the nearest thing I could find that I could potentially use as a weapon, just to be safe. It was half of an old coat rack. Why a coat rack was lying broken in half on the floor, I don't know, but I was thankful to have some security. I continued walking through the house. It looked like the house made a big circle, so I decided to go right and work my way around. I saw several pieces of overturned furniture. Kids probably found this place and had destroyed it. There was a very fancy looking table torn into pieces in the next room. One of the legs was missing entirely. I wondered if that was the table S wrote about in the first letter. It was bizarre to see an item which was spoken of with such cherished remembrance, now forsaken and in complete disrepair. As I wrapped around, I found myself in the kitchen. A wood stove was in the corner, along with cabinets of pots and pans. There were several jars of things which had long since turned black. No cans, though. Just glass jars. No refrigerator, either. The age of the house was becoming more apparent with each room. I walked past a back door that led to a very small porch and some broken steps leading down. I kept walking until I got to the last room in the back left corner of the house. A large bookshelf loomed ominously against the wall. I got a feeling of dread just looking at it. I kept moving. I just saw more tattered furniture. Then, that was it. I was back at the door. It wasn't a huge house, but I thought there must be more to it. I was about to walk out when I remembered the image. There was that little room off to the side on the foundation. That wasn't there. What was there, however, was that bookshelf. I peered at it as if we were staring each other down. Finally, I gathered enough courage to walk over to it. I tried pushing it off to the side, but it wouldn't slide. I stuck the piece of coat rack I had in between the shelf and the wall and pulled. The whole shelf came crashing down, rotted and torn books scattered as filth filled the air. I didn't want to think about what I was breathing in. The dust settled and I could see the wall. It was just a wall, though. No door or anything. Just a wall with a couple of holes in it. Holes I could barely see through. There has to be something on the other side, though, or else it would be lit up from the sunlight outside. At that point, I kicked myself for not remembering to bring a flashlight. This section of the wall was also a different color from the rest. Why would they wall over a room? I poked one of the holes with the coat rack, and the wall began to crumble away. I started hitting the wall with the coat rack, breaking it apart with each blow. Whatever this wall was made out of, probably very old drywall, was incredibly easy to break. Finally, I stopped when I'd made a hole that I could walk through. I could see light floating into the room now. For obvious reasons, I was quite reticent to enter. At last, I took a step through the hole, but still couldn't see anything. I stepped to the side so I wouldn't block the light, and then closed my eyes. I told myself that this was to let them adjust to the darkness, but in truth, I was terrified of what I might see when I opened them. I opened them when the anticipation had ultimately become too much to bear. The wall was covered in scratches in the distinctive pattern of a desperate person trying to deny their current fate. The scratches were accompanied with various writings. Nothing that I could really make out. Perhaps it was nonsense. The amount of hate that this room housed, or elicited, was overwhelming. Someone must have been locked in this room. Suddenly, the lines from the letter appeared in my mind. This must have been the room that S talked about in her letter. I began scanning the floor when I saw, over in the far corner, the dusty, ironic grin of a skull staring at me. I immediately ran out of the room, but I couldn't tear my gaze away from the skull. It was attached to a dress. A beautiful, stained, 
and old-fashioned dress. A dress with what appeared to be the missing table leg sticking out of it. I understood then why that room was walled over. I ran out of the house, into my car, and began driving. As I caught my breath and drove off, I looked over at the line of trees. I could see, in the spaces between the trunks and branches, a large field. In the field I saw a deer walking around and eating some grass. Seeing this life lifted my spirits. Everything was okay out here. What had happened in that house was horrible, but it was only in that house. Out here was free. Out here was safe. I continued driving past the trees and got to where the road began to curve slightly. The line of trees broke into an open lot right by the curve. I instantly thought of that map that was in the envelope. I pulled over to the side of the road and got out. I felt possessed. I was normally far too reserved to do something like this, especially after the discovery I'd just made, but I could not control myself. Walking around that plot of land, I saw a few things that may have hinted at a house having been there. Nothing necessarily indicative, but a few big rocks and a couple of bricks. This, in concert with the sudden stop in the tree line, the curve in the road, and that lone tree in the field, convinced me that this is where the other square was on the map. The boxes were the houses, and the circle was her house. I began walking to the tree. The deer ran as soon as it could see me. The tree was deceptively far away. Once I got there, I stopped and looked around, partly to see what was near me, and partly so I could rest. I could see the house from here. For a split second, I could have sworn I saw someone in the back door window, but it had to be my imagination. I was too far away to make out that kind of detail anyway. I walked around to the other side of the tree, and scanned the other side of the field. I immediately saw the rock was drawn on the map. It was a bit larger than a rock. It was a huge boulder sticking up from the ground. A forest seemed to begin at the other end of the field, and this rock was just inside the tree line. I felt rested enough to begin my walk to the forest. Upon reaching the boulder, I immediately noticed a small pile of stones at the bottom, where the boulder met the earth. I picked up all of these rocks away and placed them to the side. There, I found a small tin with a lock. The latch, however, had long ago rusted away, so it was free to open. As soon as I opened it up, I let out an audible gasp. There were several letters in the box. I pulled one out, and it had the same addresses on it as the ones I had been receiving, except that they had exchanged places. The return address was now the main address. Using the mail must have become too risky because perhaps the mailman was friends with the husband. Cleverly adapting, the covert couple devised this system, but eventually the husband must have become wise, and she wasn't even able to get this. So, these letters just sat there. Her lover would have become more and more heartbroken every time he dropped off a new letter, seeing the previous ones had not been received, and he had no word from her to hear how she was doing. Just then, I heard something. It sounded like a door closing. I looked all around, but I saw nothing. I looked back at the house, and everything looked the same. The noise was enough, however, to scare me into action. I grabbed the letters out of the box and ran back to my car. Panting, my chest on fire, I jumped into my car, turned it around, and drove to the house's mailbox. I grabbed all of the letters the ones I'd received as well as the ones from the box, and placed them in the mailbox. I then sped toward my home. As I approached my home, elated to be so close to safety, I barely tapped the brakes when turning into the driveway. Once there, I sat and breathed. I was unable to consider what had just happened, yet unable to think of anything else. I regained my composure, exited the car and walked toward my house. My heart sank as I got closer to the welcome mat to see a single, 
unopened envelope sitting on it, waiting for me. Whatever had been possessing me to so brazenly read the letters and search the home had apparently lifted its hold on me within the last few moments. I bent down and picked up the letter. Less than a glance at the front of it told me it had the same source as the others. I didn't open the letter. I didn't drive back to the house to place it with the others. I took the letter inside my house and, without malice, without joy, I simply held the letter and set fire to it. In this moment, I did not care about what had happened, nor what would happen in the future. I stared at the flame and watched the last letter turn to ash. So I really enjoyed that one. That was written by an author who also penned one of the really popular stories from the early days of my channel, a story called 1219. One of the early ones to sort of make it big and get a few thousand views. So if you haven't already heard that one, then please go back and check it out. I've put a link to it in the video description. Well, that's enough from me for tonight. We've made it through the middle of the week, and now we're heading fast towards Friday. I'll have another story for you then, and I do so hope you'll join me. But for now, bye-bye.